All right, hello everyone. Hello, hello. If you could all turn with me to uh, Mark chapter 3, verses, uh, or verse 35. Mark chapter 3, verse 35. Hello, hello. Can you hear me now? All right, all right, good enough. Uh, so over the, uh, so Mark chapter 3, verses, uh, or verse 35. So over the next four to five weeks or so, we're going to be focusing on a, on a principle in our family devotions that God is in control. God's got the power. Holy Ghost power, Holy Ghost power. So uh, during Jesus' earthly ministry, uh, we can see that uh, there, there were signs and miracles and wonders that happened. And Jesus was just setting the foundation, just the groundwork. And he was setting the example for us to follow. So what happened back then, that wasn't just supposed to be back then. That's supposed to be today, too. He's our example, following his example. So the signs, miracles, and wonders, that's something we should see today. And in the name of Jesus, we will see today. But we need to make sure uh, that we're in unity with each other. And that we're working on our faith. Faith in God. Mark chapter 3, verse 35. And it says, For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. You may be seated. So the title for today is The Value of Unity and the Price of Division. The Value of Unity and the Price of Division. So there is this principle, and we can kind of see it just barely in Mark chapter 3, verse 35, uh, about family. Now, in the first two-thirds of the Bible, you, uh, the, the focus is on family, human family, the bloodline of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 sons of Israel, and it continues on. There is Ruth. And then generations later, you have Jesse, the father of King David. Then you have Solomon and Solomon's sons, and it just keeps on going on, the first two-thirds. But then when you get into the last third of the Bible, it's still there, Jesus. And it was either the beginning of Matthew or Luke where we actually see the genealogy. It goes from Jesus, and it goes all the way back, the entire earthly bloodline, all the way back to Adam. It was important. God put it in there for a reason. But there is the human nature that just loves to wreak havoc with with God's plans. And so what God intended was the family unit to be unified together. In Genesis, it talks about how a man and a woman, they become one, one flesh, one organization, one unit. And from there, it grows. But the idea is unity, and there's power in unity. That was God's plan. But human nature likes to mess that that, uh, God's uh, uh, order up. And so we get to Jesus, and he's talking with some folks, and and he starts to broaden the definition, saying that that was the plan, but human nature keeps trying to get in the way. So we're just going to start to, we're going to look at this in a little bit of a different way. Instead of focusing on human families and human genealogies, we're going to focus on the bloodline spiritually. And the spiritual family, the family of God. And it just shows that God values unity. But there is a price when you have division. There's a price for division. So uh, as far as uh, what you value goes, so uh, anyone who has a quarter, you can look in the back in that quarter on the tail side, and there's this weird little Latin phrase. Now, as a young man, I looked at that phrase, and I was thinking to myself, what on earth does that mean? Of course, I was a young man, so I just moved on. I didn't really care a whole lot. But as I studied it out, I came across the answer. Does anyone know what e pluribus unum means? No. Nope. What was that? Almost. Almost. It has to do with one. So it, the, the, the actual Latin phrase means out of many... One out of many one. And so when the United States was being formed, you had the 13 original colonies. Now, they were all different from each other. They had different ways of doing things, different perspectives, 13 different colonies. But they all had one focus, one goal, and one dream. 
freedom. They wanted freedom from the British government. And so, despite their differences, they were unified together. Now, the British government, they had the money. They had the technology. They had the guns. They had the manpower. They had it all. They should have won, but they didn't because the 13 original colleagues, the many, they were unified. They were one. They were in it together. They were dying next to each other. And, and, and even if I die and I don't get to see the freedom, it's worth it because we're all working together for the same purpose, the same reason. E pluribus unum. The many are one. But the family of God is designed to be the same. It's supposed to follow the same principle. Because God, he loves unity. He likes unity. So in Mark chapter 3, we're actually, I'm going to go through uh, verses 20 through 35. I'm going to be reading the English Standard Version just to kind of make things a little bit, flow a little bit easier as far as our modern English language goes. Uh, so it starts off with, uh, so verse 20 through 21. There's, there's this little section here. And it, it says, uh, then he, Jesus, went home. And the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him. For they were saying, he is out of his mind. And so Jesus, he's performing signs and miracles and wonders, and then he ends up going home, his earthly family, their, their homestead. And when he gets there, people are following him, and there's just so much going on. He puts himself to the side. He serves those who are seeking him. And his family is looking at that and saying, you are crazy. What are you doing? That makes no sense. That's the earthly family of Jesus. So we'll put, a, we'll put that little story off to the side for a moment. We're going to come back to it. Just the way this, this is structured in Mark, it seems like there's this random middle part. It's just weird. It's out of place. It isn't, but it can seem that way. So we'll put that off the side. So Jesus then goes into this, 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 uh, this story. So in verses 22 through 30, it reads, And the scribes, or the Pharisees, or Sadducees, the religious people who came from Jerusalem, they were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out demons. Then he, Jesus, called to them and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, a kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. But it, it's his house, it's coming to an end. But no man can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin, for they were saying he has an unclean spirit. So it starts off with those wonderful religious folks, the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, Pastor didn't mention this, I believe it was last week, uh, where the, uh, the Pharisees, they were the religious, religious elite. They were the top of Jewish society. They had the power, they had the influence, they had the wealth. In fact, they were also in, in charge of the judicial, the, 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 the court system as well. They had, the, the, uh, they had it. They had it going for them. And so Jesus, though, he represents change. Now, out of all the people, these Pharisees, they were also students of the word, too. They knew the word. They dedicated their entire lives to the word. If anyone knew about the prophecies of the Messiah and about his coming and what to look for, it would have been the Pharisees. And so when you look at this, this example here, the Pharisees, it's almost like you can just see right through that. Wait, so and Jesus specifically says, how can Satan cast out Satan? I can almost picture in my mind Jesus saying, is that really the argument you want to be using here? You who knows better than anyone else, you who's a little too comfortable with where you're at, that's what you're going to use? What, do you want me to give you a second chance here to try and figure something else out? Can't, Satan casting out Satan. That makes a lot of sense, guys. 
But here he is. And so Jesus, he, he, he turns their argument right back upon them. And he's talking about how a, a kingdom divided, it can't function. It can't work. Division doesn't prosper. It tears itself apart. Unity is where the strength is at. Working together for a common goal. Satan's house is not divided. It's unified. Against what? Against the things of God. Against the people of God. Against his plans. And so, so Jesus, he just knocks their argument right out of the water. Nice try. That actually doesn't work. And then he moves on to this other example. He talks about the strong man. And you can look at that and say, that's also really random. Where is that going? So a little bit before uh, Jesus uh, is here with the Pharisees, he's in the wilderness for about 40 days. And he's fasting for 40 days. And at the end of that fasting, trouble comes. Satan comes along. He's trying to knock Jesus off track. And, and, and what's really cool is Miracles, signs, and wonders, that didn't happen before the wilderness. That happened after the wilderness. And so what you, when you can look at that example, Jesus talking about the strong man, you have to bind the strong man first before you can plunder the house. So he's saying, I've already plundered the house, or I'm plundering the house. I've bound the strong man. Satan tried to come against me. It didn't work for him, and eventually I had enough. I told him, Satan, get behind me. Not go away. No, no, no. Get in your place. Get behind me. I'm taking the king, the, the, the keys of the kingdom back. This is my creation, not yours. I have the final say. Get behind me. Get in your place, Satan. So he bound the strong man. So that's what he's talking about there. And then he, 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 he moves right along. All right. He then gives this warning to the Pharisees. Those who sin, those who sin out of ignorance, God is merciful. God will forgive people. If they really are repentant, if they really are trying to do things right, he's forg he'll forgive. He will. But if you knowing Pharisees, you know. I, I see your heart. You know what you're doing. You know all the prophecies, you know what's going on, and yet you're still choosing to oppose me, to oppose God. And you're calling my works the things of God? You're calling them Satan's work. How dare you? Don't you dare associate the things of the devil with the things of the holy, righteous God. There is no comparison here. And so he says, those people who sin in ignorance... Forgiveness. But those who knowingly do the wrong thing, who work against my ways, my will, the righteous judge declares a sentence. There is no forgiveness for that. So he gives them the warning. He, he just gets it out there. You can almost see the frustration Jesus has. Like, no, no, done, no. This is the sentence. I'm the righteous judge. Here it is. He just lays it right out there. I, I wish I'd been a fly in the wall in that place, you know? Anyways, anyways, so then this, uh, the scripture moves on. In verse uh, t uh, 31 through 35, it talks about, uh, and his mother and his brothers, they came to the house. And they were standing outside, and they called to him. And the crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside, and they're seeking you. And he answered them, who are my mother and my brothers? Who are they? And looking around who, uh, those who were sitting around him, he said, you, here are my, brother, or my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. So Jesus, there's the family bloodline, right? The earthly family. His family, in their ignorance, they're working against the things of God. Jesus, you're crazy. Jesus, what are you doing? And so he's, 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 he's taking that family structure and he's saying, we're just going to start putting this into the kingdom of God. This is how God actually intended this to be. We're not going to be focusing on the, fa the physical family as much anymore. We're actually going to be headed this direction. We're focusing on the spiritual. A new family is going to be coming from this. The spiritual family, the family of God. He redefines family. In a good way, not like we like to do today. But God values that unity, though. The whole purpose is the family works together. They are one 
one flesh, one body, the body of Christ. So uh, there's this um, old, old Greek fella by the name of Aesop. You probably heard some of his fables, some of his stories. Uh, and so there's one in particular. This is straight from the Library of Congress. So if it's wrong, you can br blame the United States government. Uh, but this story, uh, it's, it's called The Four Oxen and the Lion. And, and it says, A lion used to prowl about in a field in which were four oxen, where they used to dwell. Many a time he tried to attack them, but whenever he would come near, they turned their tails to one another so that whichever way he approached, he was met by the horns of one of them. At last, however, they fell a quarreling among themselves, and each went off to pasture alone in a separate corner of the field. Then the lion attacked them one by one and soon made an end to all four. And then it ends with, united we stand, divided we fall. There's a price for division. Brother Russell, you taught, uh, I, I believe it was last week, it was very recent, about uh, being filled with God's glory. How each and every one of us, we have a unique purpose. We have a unique design that God formed and crafted us in our mother's womb. He made us for a purpose and for a reason. We each have that purpose. We each have a call to serve, to minister. And it takes each of our different talents and abilities working together as the family. It's vital. It's important. Unity. It's so important. Pastor also taught about, the, the, in, in the message of the three resumes, about I think it was, he used 1 Peter uh, 2, where it talks about um, we, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. We are a chosen people of God. God chose us for a purpose, for a reason. Each and every one of us. So establishing, though, that Jesus, uh, like he, he, he went and he bound the strong man. He bound Satan. He bound him in his own house. Right? So Jesus has all the power. So whenever you see the signs and miracles and wonders, that wasn't just back then. That is for us today. He has all power. He took everything back that belonged to him. He is almighty God. He can do anything. He can do everything because he's just God that way. That's who he is. That's the God that we serve. And for those who are part of the family of God, you display certain traits. And so how do you uh, become part of the family of God, though? Well, it tells us in Acts 2.38. That's the foundation, right? So there was the question, what do we do to be saved? And the answer was, repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus, fully submerged under water, and being filled with the Holy Spirit of God, with the evidence of speaking a different language. Of course, that was just the first step, just the foundation. Every day, seeking God. That's continuing to be unified with God's plan and with God's people, seeking him, praying, seeking his will. What is it you want today? Lord Jesus, help me to be ready for what's coming down the pike this week or later on today. Lord, the temptation that so easily beset me, help me, Jesus, to make sure I'm keeping my eyes on you no matter what's happening, living that holy life. And when God pokes us and prods us to do something we might not want to do, like witness to someone that they aren't really pleasant to be around. Being in a place where I can actually say, Jesus, I will obey. Because it's not about my want or my preference or my comfort zone. It's about your will. It's about being unified with your plan, with your people, with the church, the body of the living God. I've been hearing a lot of preaching on that one. In John 13, 35, it says, By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Love, being united, caring for each other, putting each other first. Putting each other first. The more time you spend with God, the Heavenly Father, the more of his traits you start to display. I think Pastor talked about you have some folks that they're just so connected with God that you, you, just, have, you just get the heebie-jeebies. But in a good way, because there's something there 
Yeah, exactly. There's power there, but it's not man's power. It's God's power, God's traits reflecting from a member of the body. God values unity. But in our modern English, we like to mesh words together, combine words. So, for example, love. There are so many different words about for love. If you look in the Greek or just even uh, different languages like Germans, uh, the German language, love for this and love for that and the like and so on and so forth. But today, we in our modern English, we like to, to mesh things together. And so unity, there's kind of two different ways to look at that. You have unity and you have what's called uniformity. Now, uniformity, you look, you talk, you act, you pretty much think the exact same way. You're all going the same direction the exact same way. Now, that can be good in certain situations. For example, the military. Thank you, Jesus, that we have a very competent military. They keep us safe. They keep other people safe. That's necessary. They're uniformed together, though. They're trained to do and think and act the exact same way, uniform. There was a good part of that, yes. But God's plan for his people is a little different than that sort of unity. No, he wants his people to look, talk, and act a little different from each other. Because, Cody, you and I function very differently. Maybe a better example, Jacob, you and I are very, very different people. We look at things in very different ways. But that's not a bad thing because that's how God made you. That's how God made me. We're different. And God designed us that way. It's part of his plan. And so we don't want to be the exact same person. We don't want to talk and look and act the same because we need that diversity, that difference. It's the difference. It's the flavor of life. It's the flavor of the family, the church of God. And sometimes when someone does something that I may not like or I may not think it's the best way to do it, it might not be the best way for me. But I function a certain way. It might be the best way for you, Bob, because we're different. Now, it might be, Bob, if I'm, if I'm so stuck on my own way of doing things and I don't let you have your way or, or tell me about how you do things, I might miss an opportunity to improve myself, too. You might have a better way than me. I don't know. But that's part of unity, working together, strengthening each other, loving each other, putting each other first, listening to each other, and encouraging each other with love. But differences can divide. And so you can see the perfect example in the Tower of Babel. So you have these people in Genesis. God, he passes judgment on the earth. There is the great flood. And after that, people repopulate. And they start to build a tower. And whenever I was reading that story uh, um, uh, several years ago, I remember thinking to myself, you know, that's kind of ridiculous. God, Almighty God, who can do anything and everything... These people are trying to rebel against God and saying, God, we're not going to let you do this to us again. They're building a tower. You really think that's going to make sense too? It's, an, it's kind of another head scratcher. Uh, your, your solution is to build a tower. Yeah, God, God can knock that tower down. And, but God, he actually, in a way, he kind of does. He stops the progress because he looks down from heaven. And it's recorded in Genesis. He looks down and he, and he notes these people are really unified. There's a power there. They can do pretty much anything because they're so unified. But they're in rebellion to me. And so what he does is he goes down and he causes confusion. He gives them different languages. So one at one point, they're talking the same language. And then one guy says, hey, pass me the hammer. And the other guy's saying, what gibberish was that? They can't communicate anymore. They can't function together. Their unity is divided and it falls. And they stop working on this tower. God has the final way, either way. <laughs> but the, the power of unity, but also the price for division. But it's our unity that makes things so powerful. Another biblical example is in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. It tells us that when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord 
in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared uh, uh, to them divided tongues as of fire that sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as God gave them the ability What was, so that was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon mankind. It was incredible, a special moment. The church was born. The body had been delivered, and here it was. But what was required, or what happened just before that? They were all in one place with one accord. They were all unified together. They were all seeking God's will. And when God, or when they, he saw that, that's when he acted because they were ready. They were hungry. They wanted. And they were patiently waiting on God, being unified together. In Revelation chapter 10, verses 9 through 10, the apostle, or the, uh, the apostle John, he, he wrote this. After I looked, or I saw these things, I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number of all nations tribes peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed with white robes and with palm branches in their hands and they were crying out with a loud voice saying salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb such a powerful image because you can see diversity all nations all people all tongues all different people they were all standing before God they were in white they were their sins were washed away and they were unified together differences but yet unified that's the promise that's the goal that's the end of the road I want to get there. I want to be standing before that throne crying, holy is the Lord. Glory to God. Salvation belongs to him. I want to have a place at that throne wearing the right white robes, adding my own unique flavor to that praise and worship. God values unity and he's the one who unites people. Yes, at at the Tower of Babel, he divided them. They were in rebellion. But only God can truly, really unite us. We're so different sometimes. But God's the common denominator. God's the one who brings his people together. Without God, division. God never intended for us to be the same. And I want to make sure that in my life, I'm showing the traits of God. Not just in here, though, out there, at work, at the store, at the coffee shop I go to all the time, and I'm a familiar face. Any way and every way I can. I want people to be a little weirded out when I walk in, but in the good way, because there's something there that I need. That's the traits of the people of God. And we're going to end here and. Pretty soon we're going to be having our 5 o'clock service, but I don't know about you, but I'm ready to have some church. It was hard not to preach this outright. So we are all dismissed in the name of Jesus, and we'll be back here in 30 minutes to rock out.